Hi, everyone. Christopher Wells here for the Restaurant Show podcast. I want to welcome you to episode number one. Um, this is a podcast that will be talking about uh, the restaurant industry. I want to make this fun, informative, talk to you about some industry news, some trends. Uh, definitely going to get some interviews going in some uh, future episodes. Uh, I want to talk about the biz. I want to tickle your brain. I want to throw ideas out there. I talk about some stuff that I see going around. I'd love to get your feedback. Um, don't hesitate to leave me some comments here on the blog or find me on my website at restaurantbuildingblocks.com. Let's get this show on the road. So again, welcome to the Restaurant Show podcast, episode number one. Uh, first thing I want to tell you about, I had a chance to speak at the uh, CRFA show, which is the Canadian Restaurant and Food Service Association uh, trade show in Toronto. Basically the biggest trade show in Canada. It was a blast. I uh, got to do two uh, talks there. I did one that was in the um, the new Shake and Sling section that they have, which was more bar and um, and booze focused. Can I tell you that it was definitely one of the busiest uh, sections of the show? I covered about maybe not even one tenth of it, but they had this little um, separate separated area that had some um, some wine, some booze tastings, um, a few really uh, fun things in that area. They also had a few seminars that were related to uh, alcohol, wineless making, cocktails, and all that. And they um, had asked me if I would give a talk there, which was, uh, in my case, focused on how to drive wine sales. Do you need a mixologist to create a fun cocktail list? And um, what are five questions to sell the perfect martini? So that was really fun. Um, the first one was a little quieter. Uh, but uh, the people that were in it had a lot of questions, were very um, into it, and it was a great interaction. So the Shake and Sling was a nice add-on to the uh, to the show. Um, the show was very busy. I was quite impressed with the size of it. Obviously, it's the biggest one in Canada. A um, lot of uh, ex- exhibitors and a lot of attendees, I think somewhere between fifteen and 20,000 um, attendees showed up over the three days that it lasted. It was a great chance to meet new people. I obviously, bump into some people I already knew. Um, the second talk I gave was Five Principles for Restaurant Success. Uh, that one had really good attendance. Um, I got hugs and kisses by some of the attendees after. So they, they really enjoyed it um, and got some value out of that and some stuff they can use in their restaurants when they go back. So that was very exciting. Um, not the biggest talk I'd done, but definitely um, energy-wise, a really fun one. I've had a chance to speak in front of hundreds of people before. Um, this one was, uh, I don't know, maybe 50, 75 people attended. But um, the uh, the atmosphere and the energy in the room was quite high, which was fun because I was one of the last speakers on the last day. So I was a little bit afraid that uh, maybe people would be tired and you know ready to move on and go back to the restaurant at that point. So um, great turnout. Um, obviously, people want to mingle, right? Um, when you go to a show like that, I, I mean, there was it's a big one. There was probably at least uh, 15 different POS companies. And 15 different companies for for that take you know credit card payments and stuff like that. So at some point, you know, how many times do you want to have somebody explain to you how their POS works? And especially if you have one in your restaurant. But I realize that restauranters and people in the industry going to these shows, they want to mingle. They want to see other people from the industry. Um, sometimes when you talk to people, you realize we're all in the same boat. We're all doing the same things. Uh, we're all struggling to get by. We're all scraping to. Uh, Make sure that you know there's money left at the end of the month, and that you know our guests are happy and they want to come back, and and it's it's fun to mingle. Um, I think this one is a big one. They have a lot of money to bring in people. It's in Toronto, which is a huge market. Which I was surprised there was a lot of people from Montreal and other places because Montreal doesn't have any trade shows anymore. There were two of them, and attendance was low, and um, they just canceled them because they obviously, I guess, were losing money on them. And the one in Toronto, I'm sure that there's some years where they might have been busier. And, and I think one of the reasons they're not as popular as they used to be is that, you know, the trade shows, um, the core of it is it's really large companies with huge budgets that have these uh, really um, large um, boots where they sell, you know, $40,000 piece of equipment, of you know, combi oven that cleans itself, um, except for hotels and really large chains. Most restaurants don't have the money to invest in stuff like that um the other thing is that most of the stuff that you would go and see i like it for the tastings it's fun to taste some products but i'll give you an example a few years ago i was looking for some takeout um, packaging for one of my clients 
So I went to the show in Montreal and I went to see what was being done and what the you know the cheap stuff was and what the um, biodegradable stuff was and how it compared in prices and I could touch and see them. And nowadays, for most of the stuff, you can go online, you can Google what you're looking for, you can see you know HD pictures, and you can order some samples, and then you can not even without getting out of your home or your restaurant, you can have access to some of the stuff that you want. And then make a, a decision to buy and buy it online without even having a rep coming to your restaurant or you yourself having to go. So I think years ago, before the Internet, these trade shows uh, definitely had value because people wanted to go touch, feel, see what was being done. Nowadays, with the Internet and emails and, and shipping, you know, UPS, FedEx, uh, as easy as it is, it's very easy to, to get some samples or to get a brochure or, or to get the information you know, directly on the website. So I think that's a reason why people don't want to spend money to go out to these shows. And I really, I think the people who do go out, go for educational sessions, go to mingle with other people and maybe taste some products. And I mean, I saw a bunch of people hang out in the shake and sling area that they had where they had some, uh, some free booze flowing um, to kind of relax and uh, mingle with other people. So I had, I drove back on the, um, on the day that I spoke because I had some business to attend to in a snowstorm. But that was not a lot of fun, seeing that it takes about, you know, in good weather, five hours from where I live to uh, Toronto. Uh, took about six and a half to come back. Um, so, you know, very excited to speak. Uh, a little edgy by the time I got home. Couldn't wait to get back home. Um, one thing I want to mention, and this is not, um, this is really just because it's a product I, I saw that I really liked. One thing that struck me, um, I forget the young man's name. Um, actually, I have it card right here um this young man called bryce north is a ceo of a company called advolve media and i really like what they were doing um they uh, came up with a product they're in winnipeg manitoba but uh, i guess they're working all over canada and potentially the united states basically what they've come up with is um if you ever been in a bathroom where they have these um publicities now they've upgraded from the posters you know in that metal frame to some of them now have these screens with some ads that are playing on them well what advolve media has done is they um do that thing in a mirror in a special mirror that they install in your bathroom and it'll play uh, advertising it can advertise some of the stuff from your restaurant but it can also um, do it with some uh, outside um, advertising that they will sell so Usually, the, the money that you make on the advertising will at least offset the cost of the equipment. It looks really neat. Um, you can see them. I haven't even seen their website. They had a cool demo over there. Um, but you can visit advolvemedia.com, A-D-V-O-L-V-E-M-E-D-I-A.com. And uh, CEO Bryce Nort, a really nice guy, um, young entrepreneur that definitely, you know, He's got his head on his shoulder. A great idea. They're expanding all over. So, I mean, check it out. I mean, I don't know it would fit for, for every type of restaurant, but I, I immediately thought of a few of my clients and a few restaurants that I work with that could use that. Nightclubs, um, higher-end restaurants would definitely uh, look great. So that might be something you want to check out. Um, want to shout out to, uh, to Bryce. Very nice chatting with you at the show. And that was one thing that really struck out for me. Another thing that came out at the uh, at the show um, was they do a uh, breakfast, a, a popular event is their, their uh, um, I forget the name of it, but they do a breakfast which is uh, hosted by George Strombolopoulos from CBC. Um, and in there, one of the big things that comes out of it is there's a panel and they talk about you know, different things uh, affecting the industry, but they always talks about the trends. And um, looking at what came out of their conversation and other articles I've seen, I just wanted to touch base on a few uh, big trends that will be around for 2014 um, in the restaurant industry. Um, what seems to be the biggest one right now is the gluten-free craze, I would even call it. Um, definitely allergies are something that's really uh, come about as something that we need to be conscious of and to cater to with our guests. And gluten-free is definitely the one that stood out the most. A little annoying sometimes in the restaurant because people call them allergies when they're a lot of times more you know, a preference or... Um, a slight intolerance, but um, we need to um, adapt to where the market is going, obviously, um, as our guests you know, pay our bills and other people are being conscious of this. So you need to be too. So gluten-free, and it's not just the allergy, but also 
sports and fitness uh, enthusiasts, uh, paleo diets and, and different kinds of diets that are popular out there um, are trying to avoid a lot of the gluten stuff, a lot of the you know grain-based breads. So important for you to be aware um, that have a, at least an option. And if you don't want to make it in-house, I know some places make their own gluten-free bread. It's a bit of, could be a long process. Um, not easy to create a really good product either for a lot of people. I've had a, a chance to try a few gluten-free pizzas. And they're not all created the same, but um, you can buy. There's a lot of companies that do some great stuff um, that are, uh, you know, let's say, gluten-free crackers. So if somebody, whether to go with tartare, charcuterie, or cheeses, at least you have an option in-house. Uh, you don't have to overstock it. You keep, you know, a minimum amount. You don't have to have somebody spend money. Uh, you know, on you don't have to spend money on labor having somebody create <clears throat> a gluten-free product out there. There's definitely stuff that um, that's a quality product that you can use. That's definitely something that's growing. Um, I've even myself found uh, that lately um, with some of the workouts I've been doing and some of the diets that I've been trying to follow, I try to avoid gluten. So I do find when I go out, it's not the easiest thing. I'm not at the point where I I try to eat gluten-free all the time when I'm out, but that's something I've been conscious of. So um, if a bread lover like me is conscious of stuff like that, it means that um, it's out there and, and more and more people are talking about it. Another thing is craft beers. So craft beers, microbreweries, uber popular. I live in Quebec where there's like, I think, 120 microbrews that are producing and selling. Um, some of them are, are getting um, pretty big, actually, and are, are growing. And some of the biggest breweries in Quebec actually started as microbrews uh, 10, 15 years ago um, in Ontario. A bunch of them all over the United States and the rest of Canada. So, so the craft beer market is really big. The fun stuff with that is that they're smaller companies, right? So... Um, the large ones sometimes will hold you to contracts and, and contracts that say you can only sell their draft beers or um, you know, they'll give you some, some good uh, rebates on their stuff, but you're limited in what you can sell. And a lot of people are looking for these products when they go out. So some of the smaller breweries will be very open to having no contracts. Uh, they're smaller companies. You can change more often. So you can carry their products for a while, give them good exposure, and you can um, kind of like refreshing your wine list. You can easily um, kind of roll through uh, a bunch of microbreweries, and, and for the most part, they produce some quality products and some quality beers. So um, that's some uh, something that's very popular, and I mean, offer and demand is there, so you can definitely easily um, kind of Google, uh, you know, local craft beers, local microbrews to where close to where you are. You can. They'll send you some samples, and and most of them will do a you know draft, and you can definitely modify your offer quite frequently on the craft beer department. Um, the other one is another trend is local sourced food, right? Local farming. Um, it's funny to me as the world becomes a global market with the internet and economy the way it's been the last 15, 20 years. Um, the more that expands, and people were saying how I guess it was a bad thing because they would. You know, local or, or, or your backyard wouldn't count as much. It's funny as the world gets more global, I find that people want to buy more local and want to make sure that their local business um, strives and survives. And that's always been, um, it's funny how, how that's changed around. But a lot of chefs want to make sure that they source their foods locally. And a lot of people are looking for that. That's something that when you advertise that on your website, on your Facebook page, on Twitter, that you're working with a local farm, uh, with a, you know, local products, People are, are looking to that for that. They don't want to be having the stuff that's uh, that's been in a truck for uh, two thousand miles and I had to drive you know across the continent. So that's I think a very positive thing. And um, and the last one I want to tell you about another, another trend that's been kind of up and coming, uh, always been around, but um, it's really just kind of going everywhere right now is charcuteries, um, charcuterie boards, cheese plates. Um, everybody's making their own charcuteries now. Um, and using not the old traditional, you know, pork terrine and, and foie gras pâté, but now everybody's making their duck ham and their brazolas. Um, that's just something that when you produce it in-house, uh, you can produce for um, not too much money if you're smart and you know how to work your stuff, but you can sell for a premium price. Most places you go to, and the charcuterie boards are $15, $20, $25, 30 depending on how many uh, meats or cheeses you put on there, but... Uh, once you've made a you know a batch of of, uh, of brazola in house and you've made a chutney yourself and a mustard and and some crackers and we talked about gluten free before and maybe you have a gluten free option on there 
Um, definitely something that um, a lot of restaurants are going to, a lot of guests are looking for. Um, I've gone out lately with people and we've just shared like these huge charcuterie and cheese boards and basically didn't even have any other food and wind up spending as much money as we did when we have the regular stuff. Um, and for other restaurants, it's also a great option to um, have food later. So if uh, your kitchen shuts down at 9, 10, 11, um, a lot of places are doing charcuteries until 12 or 1 o'clock. Uh, people love to have a nice beer or glass of wine with that stuff. So a um, lot of potential money-wise there. And that's something that really attracts people if it's well done. Um, and it's fairly priced. Uh, I've been to a few places where uh, they were on the cheaper side. And it's a little frustrating when you're spending uh, $25, $30 and for a couple of slices of meat and a bit of mustard. But when it's um, mainly most people do it really well, and that's definitely something that's attracting people and that they're willing to spend money on when they get quality. So those are a few of the popular trends that are going on right now in the restaurant industry. Uh, moving on. And the next item on our list for this first episode of the restaurant show um, is a um, situation that happened in Montreal uh, a few months back. And I've been looking at I wasn't sure how to address it. Like I figured, you know, Facebook posts would be short and I do all kinds of videos, but it's something I wanted to spend maybe a bit more time than, you know, the minute long videos I usually make. So the uh, on the South Shore of Montreal, a restaurant fired a server um, who offered a ride to a regular because he seemed uh, inebriated. By the time she closed up, uh, he was one of the last ones to get out, clearly was not in a state to drive. Um, and she, you know, I guess trying to, go above and beyond and making sure that he was safe, said, maybe I should drive you. You, sh you don't look like you're in, in, in a state to be driving. He was actually pretty polite about it, I guess, at first, but said, you know, I'm fine. I, no, no, it's okay. Went back to the restaurant the next day and complained to the owner that, I guess, um, she was out of line and it was not her call to make. Um, and the law in Quebec is a little more lenient than it is elsewhere. I know in all places in the rest of Canada, and don't know how it is, I guess it's, it can be different from state to state in the United States. Um, in other provinces in Canada, you are you could be held responsible if that you know guest of yours was to drive um, after he consumed in your uh, business and an accident happened. You could be held responsible. The business could be um, now in Quebec. Some of those things are in the law, or you know, want to they're trying to integrate it, but it's definitely more lenient than than elsewhere. Um, I guess in her case, she was being proactive for for that gentleman's life and and other people on the road. Um, so the owner fired her, which um, I was very surprised with how our local laws are that um, that made it to the paper and that she he got away with, with doing that. I felt like he could have stood up for her. She did what she thought was right. Legally, she was right to do it. I think I don't care how much money a guest spent in your restaurant. If he's about to go out there and drive... Um, in an inebriated state where he shouldn't be driving and um, she could have just ignored it and she went out of her way to um, offer him a ride and to try to be uh, nice about it um, I think the owner um, was definitely wrong I think there's a time where you need to stand up for your um, your staff and whether it be because a guest is way out of line um, verbally or even worse if it's you know, physically um, I think there's a moment where um, you need to um, stand up for them and not guess are always right until they go over the line. And I think that um, verbally or physically um, going over the line is definitely um, not acceptable. And I don't really understand what the owner was afraid of. Like, Who in their right mind would be angry at the owner of the restaurant for supporting his server um, when... If she lets that guy drive and he kills somebody, um, then maybe a finger could have been pointed at them or at her for not doing anything. If that guest felt like they were disrespectful to him and it was unacceptable, you know, sometimes people, if you don't bend over backwards to everything they ask and say, listen, I don't think she was out of line. I think she did what she had to do. You probably shouldn't have driven. Would you agree with that? Um, what would have been better if she called the cops on you and, and you're, you're logical in the explanation you give to that guest? If, if he still believes that you are that wrong, maybe it's not the kind of guest that you want in your restaurant. And you work hard enough to hire the right people. You work hard enough to train them. And in this case, she seemed like she had her head on her shoulders and she was trying to do the good thing for, for 
I guess, the restaurant herself, that guest and, and you know, society in general. Um, some people just don't care, would have not even cared about it, walked away, not, not done anything about it. I think his handling of the situation was very poor and the fact that she got fired. I know that through the news, I heard she got offered jobs by other restaurants after this happened because it did make social media and a couple of papers in Montreal. So I'm not worried for her. Um, I'm sure that um, she found work where uh, she would be more appreciated anyway. She probably didn't, you know, he probably didn't deserve to have her anyways if that's the kind of owner he is. But I think sometimes you need to think a little further than and the guest is always right. Um, they are always right. And I treat them as such and I want you to treat them as such. But there's a line where um, society and, and acceptable behavior uh, needs to not be crossed. And I think that's one of those lines. So um, think of that. There's moments where you want to support your staff and you want to you know, maybe explain um, the reality of life to uh, some of your guests. Moving on. And last but not least, to uh, close out this uh, first episode of The Restaurant Show, I want to talk to you about um, what I guess I'll call the kitchen nightmare effect. Um, the kitchen nightmare is a show with Gordon Ramsay. Um, the original show was um, done in the UK for, I guess, three or four seasons. And it's been, I think, for like seven seasons on Fox in the in the U.S. Um, the U.S. one is a bit more scripted than the um, than the U.K. one. But um, I work with restaurants all the time, and whenever I explain to people what I do as a restaurant you know, coach, trainer, keynote speaker, people tell me, "Oh, you're like you know the, those shows on TV." Um, I guess um, it could be similar in a sense that I try to help restaurants, um, you know, have systems that work for them. Uh, make sure that their training is adequate, that people know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, not as romantic or as you know volatile as uh, the TV show is. But one thing that really um, struck me is as I, I really appreciate the first series, I haven't been really watching um, the one on Fox because it is kind of scripted and, and a little over the top. But um, when I read on the show online, a lot of the restaurant owners that had done the experiment, the experience or, or done the show with Gordon uh, Ramsay, um, kept saying that it didn't work and they reverted to their old ways and changed their menu back and because you know he had changed the concept or he had changed the menu and, and they didn't stick with the ideas and there was one on eater.com a few days ago from a Nashville chef called John Chapman and uh, they're saying that the episode hasn't even aired yet and they contacted him because he used to have a restaurant in New Orleans and um and now they they um, wanted to do a show with him at his new restaurant. So and that since um, Gordon Ramsay and his team has left, they they've reverted to the old menu. Um, that the menu he did didn't work um, because I guess they didn't understand his business. And and one thing I realize is a lot of people I work with um, are the same way. They want different results. They want to have different results, but they don't want to change anything in the business. Um, and the reason why it didn't work in the first place is a lot of times because they sucked up some of the fundamentals. Um, you do need to make changes, and there's a reason why your restaurant's not successful a lot of times, is that some of the basic stuff is not even hit. I don't care if you're tr thinking it's your marketing and you want to market and do a promotion. If the entire team is not guest-focused, and when I walk into your restaurant, I'm not guided. I don't have anybody that's you know greeting me at the door, that's showing me where to go. I'm standing there. I'm waiting. Your server is not knowledgeable knowledgeable about the menu and the wine list and, and what's in the food. And the kitchen doesn't execute properly. And the appetizers and the main course don't come in a decent amount of time. I don't care how much you market the restaurant, right? You're not hitting the fundamentals properly. Um, if your your menu doesn't make any sense, if so a lot of times people, because they've started it that way and they feel like... If they change it too much, it's, it's you know, I don't want to offend my, my, my current crowd. Well, you don't have a current crowd. The current crowd, the crowd doesn't even pay the bills. So you need to make a drastic change. You need to, you need to hit at least the minimum expectation of guests. And to do that, sometimes it means that you have to change things. And you know when you change things, it takes time. It takes time to change the culture in the restaurant with your entire team. It takes time for your guests to see the change and for that word to spread out to attract more people. So if you have weaknesses in areas and you want to modify them, changing a menu, it's not going to flip the restaurant over two, three weeks. And obviously, whenever I read these articles on a TV show or, or people I've worked with, well, you know, my, my friend or, or these and these people said that, um, that it was better before. 
Well, those three people won't pay your bills at the end of the month if they come once a month or twice a month, right? If in general people are not coming back and, and generally the, the you know the, your sales are not going up and the attendance is not, you know, people are not coming back more frequently and, and globally, if you look at comments online or stuff like that and, and people's reaction to what you're doing is not positive, then you need to change something because there's so much restaurants out there. You're competing with 20 other restaurants on your street or in your city you have to uh, be on the ball. You have to execute properly. You have to offer an experience that's adequate. I don't care if you think you make uh, the best, you know, X dish in the world. You don't. Somebody does it better somewhere else. You might do it really well. Focus on doing it well, executing, and making sure the experience is good. It's about how people feel in your restaurant before they leave uh, or when they leave, and they feel good about the money they spent. It's not about what you think works or this other guy doesn't know better than me or this other p- person tried to help me. Change takes time. When you work out, does you work out, it doesn't work so much. You still you haven't lost weight. Well, it's not just about working out, first of all. It's about your diet too, right? So working out and your diet combined are going to help you lose weight. And if you work out um, even intensely for a week, you're not going to see a change. So if you change your menu and you try to focus your, your staff on the guest experience, and after two, three weeks, you're like, well, that doesn't work. Well, that takes months to change. So what you should be doing is asking people when they leave how the experience was, how they felt about things. Make sure you get feedback. If you're going to roll out a new menu or change a concept, try to you know be logical in what you do locally around you. Um, make sure that it's something that people want, but ask them. Don't assume don't complain about the one guy who wrote a bad review on Yelp. There's always one retard that'll go and say something negative online. Focus on the people that are in your door. And as an owner, grab them at the door one by one when they go out and ask them what the experience was like, if they liked it, if they felt like they got value for their money. If you don't want to hear the answer, it's because you know something's wrong and you're not willing to face reality. When you're ready to talk to every guest that leaves your restaurant, and make sure they're 100% satisfied and to know for real how they felt about your food, your service, the atmosphere, then uh, you can tell me that you're really really, uh, willing to make changes that will affect your restaurant positively. Um, But other than that, trying to change things for a few days and and reverting to the old ways and stuff like that will never work. Um, Changes take time in anything that you do. It takes a month and more to start seeing... um, positive improvements in anything that you'll do in, in life in general, but it's the same thing in your restaurant. So it takes that amount, that amount of time to change the culture in the restaurant and make sure that your team is moving all in the same direction. So before your guests feel the uh, um, the positive results of what you're trying to do, it'll take it a little bit of time. So um, that's what I call the kitchen nightmare effect. But people uh, think, oh, I want to change and I want to, oh, these ideas are all great. But um, as soon as they don't see a change the first week or you know, within the first couple of weeks, they want to revert back to their old ways. The old ways weren't working. So keep in mind that you know the secret to our business is proper execution to create a great atmosphere, a great experience for your guests, and doing that consistently. Okay. So if you don't, if you do it one time, it's great. One time, it's average. It depends how busy we are or which server you get. Um, no, it needs to be consistent. That experience needs to be um, consistently the same because people want to know what they get into and what they'll get for their money. So make sure that uh, you execute properly to create a great experience and that you do that consistently and you will be on your way to have a successful restaurant. So I want to thank you very much for um, spending that time with me today on the uh, first episode of the Restaurant Show podcast. I'm Christopher Wells, founder of a company called Restaurant Building Blocks. Um, You can find me at restaurantbuildingblocks.com. Please don't hesitate to leave me comments. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to answer questions on future blogs. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Have a great day. Have a great service. And go and impress those guests. Talk to you soon.